वेलकम टू ई पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर विशाल जाधव असोसिएट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सोशोलॉजी तिलक महाराष्ट्र विद्यापीठ पुणे टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू लुक एट अ मॉड्यूल कॉल्ड मेथोडोलॉजी साइंस वैल्यूज ऑब्जेक्टिविटी एंड आइडियल टाइप्स ऑफ वेबर एंड दिस कम्स अंडर दी पेपर कॉल्ड क्लासिकल सोशल थियोरी बाय नाउ यू मस्ट बी क्वाइट फेमिलियर टू वॉट वेबर्स आइडियाज वर and what his theorizations were all about his understanding of verstehen which basically means interpretative sociology or interpretative understanding of the life worlds around us provides a very incisive a very deep kind of subjective understanding of how power and how social relations are organized in society this particular module will try and understand how he develops a methodology of understanding the social action of individuals and the social change that takes place in society what are the scales that he uses and what are the methods that he develops Max Weber was no doubt one of the brightest intellectuals amongst the earlier organizers of sociological thought. An overall evaluation of Weber's writings demonstrates his historical comprehension of modern western society and their economic, political, legal and religious development. Among other things, Weber wrote extensively on the methodology of social sciences, but his writings on methodology are complex and are subject of many conflicting interpretations it is weber's methodology that has been extensively read discussed debated and sometimes accepted and often refuted also for its inconsistencies weber's approach to social theory was a central feature of his work overall work by and large weber was a modernist in his overall approach to social thought considering the two classical sociologists marx and durkheim weber had a modernist perspective which also reflected in his methodology by bringing together various traditions of social theory weber thereby formed a unique theoretical perspective based on history economics philosophy law and comparative historical analysis further when compared to marx and durkheim weber's approach was not only more individualistic but also more culture oriented and both these aspects individualism and cultural orientation particularly appear in weber's perspective on methodology of social sciences we open this module by looking at the major aspects of weber's methodology which is particularly unique to weberian work and which still remains a topic of agreement disagreement as well as speculation even today we'll be examining the following historical background for weber's views and methodological issues in social sciences verstehen and science causality objectivity ideal types and values value relevance and value neutrality all the subsections included here are not airtight compartments but rather all together represents weber's methodology for the social sciences Weber's methodology with this modernist perspective has been discussed excessively among the sociologists for various reasons his methodology has always attracted special attention in the interrogation of Max Weber as he may appear unclear confused and at the same time passionate determinant and complete it is well known that Weber was completely opposed to pure abstract theorizing to the extent that Weber's theoretical ideas are embedded in his empirical usually historical research. Weber's methodology of the social science was not only unique to him but also a very important contribution to the study of society that seemed to have influenced many scholars later on. It was between 1902 and 1903 that Weber wrote a series of essays questioning the methodology of investigation in social sciences. specifically the term methodology refers to the procedures and the principles of inquiry 
in a particular discipline to obtain knowledge of society. Unlike natural sciences, the methods used in social sciences are not so clear and straightforward. A significant phase of that period was the development of social sciences. In such a context, it becomes important for Weber to distinguish between the methods of social sciences and the methods of natural sciences. Therefore, specifically, two of Weber's works stand out in particular as being of central importance in the formation of his methodological views. First, a work entitled Rocher and Nice, The Logical Problem of Historical Economies. Written between 1902 and 3, the book, a second work called Objectivity in Social Sciences and Social Policy, written between 1903 and 04. It is in the later work in which Weber discusses at length the aspects of objectivity as a part of methodology for social sciences. Weber's methodology should be understood with the fact that he was greatly inclined towards the study of history irrespective of being a lawyer and economist. Weber suggested the development of clear concepts so that a causal analysis of historical phenomena can be performed. Therefore, Weber's perspective and methodology was a fusion of historical and sociological orientations. For Weber, Historical sociology was concerned with both individuality as well as generality. For this unification to be achieved, there was development and utilization of general concepts to be known as ideal types while studying particular individuals, events or societies. Thus, with the help of these general concepts, one could arrive at the individuality of each development thereby determining the causes for differences between such developments. Weber's methodological works were in direct response to his immediate circumstances. The natural sciences grew dramatically between 1880 and 1900 in Europe. Knowledge in physics, biology and chemistry as well as experimental discoveries all advanced steadily. The scientific methodology thus became dominant within the scholarly community. This was followed by a decline in the scholarly tradition of historical and philosophical science in explaining the nature of reality. In addition, at the end of the 19th century, most scholars in social science and history were strong adherents of the broad tradition of historicism. According to the tradition of historicism, reality was seen as a historical product. However, historicism holds strong animosity towards abstract concepts. The attack of natural sciences and the defense of social sciences, particularly the historicist hegemony in Germany, became the basis for the famous method and rest, the controversy of a method that related to the issue of preference between a historical and a theoretical approach. Thus, eventually, the situation resulted in an open clash between the natural sciences and social sciences, questioning the basis of knowledge and thereby drawing attention to the differences between the methodology of the natural sciences and the methodology of the social sciences. The non-scientific nature of the historical and social sciences was largely criticized. With the general crisis by 1885, a re-examination of the relationship between the scientific method and philosophy took place. By 1890, a movement popularly known as Neo-Kantianism a return to the work of Immanuel Kant emerged in order to resolve the problem and thereby questioning the validity of scientific knowledge in itself. Kantianism can be considered the first truly secularized modern scientific methodology. William Windelband and Heinrich Ricker, two of the central thinkers of the Neo-Kantian movement, sought specific directions to solve the problem of method. These two scholars seem to have had tremendous influence on the Weber's uh, thinking about methodology of social sciences, besides the influence of William Delethi and George Simmel, all close friends of Weber. Weber's methodology was connected to the relationship between history and sociology. For this, he is also known as historical sociologist. Weber started developing his own methodological position by attempting to resolve theoretical disputes in social science pertaining to method. In a series of methodological essays written between 1903 and 6, Weber outlined the methodological foundations of the social sciences. Weber crystallized the methodological controversy step by step by showing the fundamental differences between 
natural and social sciences. Amongst other things for Weber, social science must arrive at a methodology which encompasses both general and individual aspects of historical reality, a procedure he referred to as the ideal type. In Rickert's theory of knowledge, he used the concept called value relevance, which Weber absorbed for dealing with issues of subject matter in the social sciences. According to Rickert, since judgment comes before knowing, therefore knowing itself was a kind of valuing. Further, Rickert reasoned that it is impossible to have any judgment about reality without concepts. Therefore, without concepts, knowledge of the empirical world was also impossible. The value, relevance thus became important in the subject matter of social sciences. According to the principle of value relevance, Rickert observed knowledge was not only what was observable, but at the same time and more importantly a construction of the object to be described. For Weber, knowledge can never be a reproduction of reality. Reality for Weber was infinite and inexhaustible and therefore the generalization or the individualizing method of research were both not adequate according to Weber's understanding of theory of knowledge. Both the methods have their limitations which Weber thought of overcoming by suggesting his methodology of social sciences. Wurstehand science. Wurstehand, a German word stands for understanding. Initially, the concept had its origin in theological hermeneutics. The concept of interpretative understanding that is Wurstehand was at the center of the methodological debates among the German historians and sociologists of Weber's time. The hostility characteristic to German historians and sociologists towards the positivist social thought of France and England was the background against which the idea of interpretative Wurstehen was gaining currency. It is this contribution to the methodology that one is of Weber's best known as well as debatable works in sociology. Weber's thought of on Wurstehen were relatively common among German historians of his time and are said to be derived from hermeneutics, a field with specialized approach to understanding and interpretation of published writings. Weber, of course, did not invent this method, but merely attempted to extend this idea of understanding the text to understanding of social life. It is absolutely clear for Weber, understanding was not the subtle intuitive sympathy favored by the philosophers, but intellectual, analytical and predictive explanation of action. Therefore, it wasn't the emotional understanding of the social action, but instead an intellectual understanding of social action in a particular context. For Weber, sociology was a science and Wurstehen could be verified in scientific way and therefore involved the scientific objective way of dealing with subjective understanding of any social action. The term was not a psychological one for Weber. Weber used the term to refer to the social scientist's attempt to understand both the intention and the context of human action, whereas science deals with the explanation of what is and thereby establishes its causes. For Weber, Wurstehen didn't consist of intuition or empathy, a common misconception usually held by many critics. It involved systematic and rigorous research and was therefore rational and scientific. By Wurstehen, Weber meant an interpretative understanding of subjective motivations, the social action as it is only in the actor's head, what he, she means by a particular action. Therefore, for Weber, sociology should pay attention to that particular context in which the actor performs a particular social action. This context and action can only be made meaningful by the application of Wurstein that is understanding the context and the action of the actor. There is something uniquely interesting about Weber's interpretation of Wurstein. The phenomenon of Wurstein is interpreted at a cultural level as well as at an individual level, thereby influencing different theoretical perspectives. There are different opinions about how Weber himself interpreted it and no clear agreement for the same. However, the fact remains that Weber occupies a central role in sociological theory due to such contributions. 
and Weber's contribution to understanding aspects of social research seem to have diverged in interpretativism as a theoretical paradigm. Causality As a part of his methodology, Weber was committed to the study of causality. It was an inclination to the study the causes of social phenomena, an attempt where he once again combines the general, nomothic and peculiar ideographic approaches of the positivists and subjectivists respectively. For Weber, causality was the probability that an event will be followed or accompanied by another event, much more than historical constants, repetitions, parallels it implied, according to Weber, looking at the reasons for and the meaning of historical changes. He operated from a multi-causal approach in most of his historical works. Consider, for instance, his study of the relationship between Protestantism and the spirit of capitalism, where he saw the Protestant ethic as one of the causal factors in the rise of modern spirit of capitalism. The question of causality for Weber was not answered in one way model, rather he was attuned to the interrelationships among a number of social factors. Further, his thinking on causality was also very greatly influenced by his belief about having a special understanding of social life, words to hand, which eventually makes the causal knowledge of social science different from the causal knowledge of natural sciences. The social sciences are therefore in a better position than natural sciences due to their emphasis on the understanding of human conduct. For any vision of social sciences, the idea of objectivity remains crucial. Weber is no doubt seen as the reference point for the doctrine of an objective social science. However, what is interesting about Weber's stance on objectivity in social sciences is his method of attaining that objective. With the help of ideal types and accepting one's subjectivity, value, relevance, Weber argued for objectivity in social science. Objectivity For Weber, the starting point was relevance for value. Weber argued that by having value-relevant starting points, the historian does not have to be unobjective. The causal link between means and the end however should be objectively demonstrated. With the help of ideal types, such causal links can be established. By clearly expressing a value standpoint at the beginning, true objectivity becomes possible. Subjectivity would then result from suppressing the fact of holding such standpoints. Paradoxically, the choice of relevant ideal type is also a matter of subjective choices like the choice of initial value standpoints. Therefore, it should be remembered that by objectivity, Weber did not consider it as the same as value neutrality. As we will see a little later, value neutrality is argued for only during the later stages of a social research, whereas objectivity should be maintained throughout the research. Weber's methodology is principally all about conceptualization and also the problem of producing intersubjectively meaningful selections from vast and infinite reality. The first formulation of the notion of ideal types rose in the course of Weber's thinking as an economic historian and while he was still under the influence of the German historicist Heinrich Rickert. Weber's concept of ideal type was first developed by him in a writing entitled Objectivity in Social Sciences and Social Policies published in 1905. The theorist who influenced Weber into articulating his theory of the ideal type was Heinrich Rickert. Since Rickert favored general and individual concepts, Weber rejected Rickert's theory and formulated his ideal type as an epistemological response to Rickert's theory. Ideal types. Weber defined the ideal type as a conceptual pattern which brings together certain relationships and historical events into a complex whole, whose purpose is to describe historical societies by comparing their internal and external characteristics. Weber used the ideal type as a methodological concept, a technique to describe the comparative features of different societies by outlining the distinct and social characteristics. The ideal types have indeed played a critical role 
in Weber's work and not just in empirical research. For Weber, it was the responsibility of sociologists to develop conceptual tools in order to understand empirical reality. However, such concepts are only tools and should not be confused with reality itself. The ideal type can be seen as the sum total of concepts which the researcher constructs purely for the purpose of research. Just as reality is infinite, Weber maintains that no concept can give us complete diversity of phenomena. However, Weber suggests ideal type as a solution. The term signifies ideal, typical, distinctive, characteristic or essential traits or elements of the phenomena. Here it should be remembered that ideal does not mean ethical, that it has nothing to do with what is exemplary. At the basic level, an ideal type is a conceptual construction of a social scientist on the basis of his or her and theoretical orientation so as to capture the essential features of some social phenomena. The ideal type is a model, not a hypothesis, although specific hypothesis may be derived from it, so as to compare it with empirical facts. So ideal types are like measuring rods that facilitate understanding of the essential characteristics of a particular phenomena. Although these are constructed by the social scientists, ideal types are not illogical. At the same time, as Weber suggests by calling it a utopia, such a concepts only attempt to understand the social phenomena in a prescribed form. In fact, the ideal type concept is a realization of the principle of sociological rationality, argued by Weber as his basic and original contribution to scientific analysis. For Weber, ideal types are like heuristic devices, not laws, meant to facilitate empirical research for understanding specific aspects of the social world. Also, Weber suggests to derive the ideal types inductively from the real world rather than deriving it deductively from an abstract theory as a carefully defined set of concepts. This, Weber says, will not help social scientists to understand the social phenomena. However, by real world, Weber does not suggest ideal types to be mirror images, but rather one-sided exaggerations of the essence of some social phenomena, neither too general nor too specific. For Weber, science means unending research, and since he believed in non-existence of timeless concepts in social sciences, he argued for developing new typologies that fit the constantly changing societies. With this, Weber contends a researcher can escape from his or her subjectivity as the ideal types reflect these in the very objective way. The concepts included in the ideal types are not only pure, exaggerated or one-sided, but also supposed to have a dynamic causal aspect within the society studied. Weber used the word teleological in his first presentation of the ideal type approach. However, Weber was not seen to be consistent in his usage of ideal type in his substantive work, irrespective of his clear definition. Weber's different categories or varieties of ideal types are as follows. One, historical ideal types, that is, which relate to any phenomena that existed in a particular historical period. Two, general sociological ideal types, relates to the phenomena cutting across many historical periods and society. Three, action ideal types, pure types of action based on actors' motivations. Four, structural ideal types, forms taken by the case causes and consequences of social action. According to Weber, an ideal type can help to reveal the real significance and meaning of the act that can apparently be different from the subjective meaning assigned by the actor himself or herself to the act. Thus, as heuristic tools, Weber's ideal types were an equally important contribution to the methodology of social sciences notwithstanding its inconsistencies. The attribution of values always remained the basis of Weber's sociological analysis. Weber's notion of value-free sociology has greatly influenced the modern sociological thinking on the role of values in social sciences. In 
Weber is held as the patron of saint of value free sociology. Although highly complicated, Weber's views and values are often commonly perceived as social scientists should not let the personal values influence the scientific research. Weber had specific views regarding values in the domain of teaching as well as in research. With little ambiguity and value freedom in this aspect, Weber argues that academicians should not express the personal values in classroom. Only the facts should be expressed. This was because unlike Marx, Weber believed in a possible separation of fact and value. Further, Weber also did not emphasize the facts of social reality, rather its defining quality, value, significance and meaning. However, Weber's position of value freedom in social sciences is much more ambiguous. Interestingly, Weber did not recommend a total elimination of values from social research. While qualifying the concept of value freedom, Weber did not talk about completely avoiding values, but rather offered an apparently paradoxical solution in which values could be utilized for the promotion of objectivity instead of subjectivity. In Weber's 1917 essay, The Meaning of Ethical Neutrality in Sociology and Economics, he conceptualizes that value conflicts cannot be resolved by rational means. Accordingly, rational reasoning cannot help one to solve the issue arising out of value conflicts. Thus, value neutrality was an important as well as value relevance. Social sciences for Weber should not completely part ways with values. For Weber, value orientation had nothing to do in common with value judgment or evaluation. However, Weber's qualification of value freedom or value neutrality towards value relevance has subsequently been misused and misunderstood. Hence, like any other aspects of Weber's work, issues arising of high of value neutrality and value-based relevance are also highly debatable. To conclude, we have seen that Weber, who has been a slight pessimist in terms of how he saw rationality, in, in, in the way he saw how human society was moving towards modernity, which he calls as the iron cage, he also thinks that science and values can go along in analysis because he feels unlike Durkheim who, who posits a very positivist approach, he feels science can also be used as an interpretativist tool without being biased, without having prejudices.